The debate that we will have in the coming 15 days is decisive for our country and for Europe. All those who today didn't vote for Emmanuel Macron should join our movement. You must not give a voice to Madame Le Pen. I'm calling on my electors to vote for Marine Le Pen. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, actually in Paris today. Here's what's coming up on today's program. It's been a wild morning. Advantage Macron, the first round of the French presidential elections, actually gives the incumbent a narrow lead over nationalist rival Marine Le Pen. The surge in Treasury yields sends ripples across global markets. The benchmark 10-year yield rises to 2.75 percent for the first time since 2019. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition because this hour we have top lineup of guests, including BNP Paribas chief economist William de Wilders and the former ECB president Jean-Claude Trichet. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. So first, let's check in on the markets. Danny, given I don't know whether I'm in Paris and London, maybe you take that over and tell us what's happening on the stock 600. <laughs> well, I am in London, certainly, Francine, but these markets are all over the place. It really is fueled by a bond sell. If I talked to a lot of U.S. investors before they went to bed, which would be our morning, and said, hey, I might see 3% on this U.S. 10-year yield when I wake up. Well, we're certainly not there, but it is a rise of about six basis points in that U.S. 10-year yield. Now, on the docket this week, we have CPI, PPI, import prices all coming from the U.S., so anticipation of higher inflation is driving the bond market action, not having repercussions for Europe, for U.S. stocks, but also, Francine, for the yen, that pairing 125 blowing through that level is the highest for the dollar versus the yen since 2015. And then meanwhile, looking at Europe, you are seeing a little bit of divergence here, mostly negative, but will point out there the Cacaron outperforming. Francine, I'm not going to dive too deep into this because I know you have it covered and can cover it better than I can, but a little bit of a relief rally there, especially in French banks. Yeah, now President, President Emmanuel Macron is set to face his nationalist rival Marine Le Pen in the final round of the French election in a rerun of their 2017 contest. I wish to extend a hand to all those who want to work for France. All those who today didn't vote for Emmanuel Macron should join our movement. They're able to decide what's good for the country. Never lose your faith in democracy. So you must not give a voice to Madame Le Pen. I'm calling on my electors to vote for Marine Le Pen. The game isn't over, and the debate that we will have in the coming 15 days is decisive for our country and for Europe. Well, joining us now in Paris, William de Vilder, chief economist at BNP Paribas. William, you're basically a chief economist plus a political strategist, given everything that we're seeing with the French election. What are the chances Marine Le Pen becomes president? Well... I can only look at the surveys, the polls that have been conducted, so they show a clear result, although it's far more narrow than what we have seen yeah. as a result in the previous elections. So that so also 30%. means it's... It, Let's it's, put it at 30 percent, 25 percent for Marine Le Pen? Well, you look at the, the poll results, so uh, that's what, it, what uh, they say. They say that uh, Macron will win. Um, it's going to be more of a cliffhanger than what was expected uh, yeah. previous time. So, William, what does this mean? If Marine Le Pen is president, what does it mean for the French economy? Well, what it means is then the entire focus will shift on what is going to happen for the um, parliamentary elections, because you still have a parliament and you need to have a government and you need to have a majority. That's point one. Point number two is how will the messaging change uh, once that um, the election outcome is known? Because that's another important point. We should keep in mind that the program is very much, her program is very much a program of um, I'm going to help people in terms of spending power, but it is also expensive uh, if you think what it would cost in terms of uh, budget deficits and so on. So you can already imagine that markets would then, of course, react to that uh, quite significantly. Yeah, she's anti-globalization. She's anti-immigration. She's no longer talking about Frexit. It's a France exit of the EU. But what kind of European integration would we see under her if she were to be president? Well, that is one of the important uh, question marks that we are facing today because we have been used in the European Union to have uh, a very close 
a very strong role played by France and also a very close relationship France and Germany. Um, so that how that will look like and what it means for the European agenda is a big question mark. We should not forget that the role of uh, France and Germany together in uh, launching next generation EU, for instance, has been fundamental. Um, would we have another situation? Hopefully not. Uh, what would that imply? So it's all question marks, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Um, well, yeah, so many questions, Mark, and very few answers, which is why we're trying to break mm. it down and really make our viewers understand what we're looking at. So if you talk about debt to GDP ratio, and this is one of the main concerns, people like uh, Marine Le Pen, she has momentum in her campaign because she's saying, look, I will take care of you. I will subsidize this, this and this to make sure that your cost of living doesn't increase too much. If she pushes and gets through what she's promised, what kind of debt to GDP ratio would France have? Well, I cannot put out a number just like that because it means that um, what exactly she would do, what is clear though, is that what I would expect is that in the next two weeks there's going to be a very strong emphasis put on please people be attentive, pay attention to the fact that everything that is being promised will come at a considerable cost in terms of finances and that means more debt and that means and the voter cares about this spread. well that is that is what you have a campaign for to be very clear so what i would also expect is that in the next two weeks it's really uh, you take off the gloves and you will be very clear on both sides by the way and um, what i would also expect is that there's going to be a strong insistence on all the efforts that have been put in place and that, that were effective, um, in particular in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, to really cushion the impact uh, to households. Now, I must admit, the, that's what you said. Uh, it's a very clear program that she's offering. I'm going to do this and this and that, and you will feel better off in the short run. Yeah, and depends who pays for it. To William, thank you so much. William de Vilder there, chief economist at BNP Paribas, stays with us and we'll talk a little bit more also about the Fed and maybe the Treasury move that we're seeing today. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. I don't think we have Leanne, actually. We'll get back to Leanne in just a second. Um, we heard, of course, from Leanne Gerens going through a number of stories that we're seeing also in Pakistan, a number of things happening with uh, Elon Musk. Now, we're getting some breaking news out of Glencore. Glencore trading above its IPO price for the first time since 2011. Now, right before stepping down, we did hear from the former Glencore chief executive, and he was telling me that what uh, the market is misunderstanding in the transition and transitioning for a very fossil field led economy to what we're seeing in terms of renewables we have to make sure that we have the pieces and we have also some of the rare earths needed for the transition so we'll have plenty more of course on that throughout the day then we go back to uh, Paris we come back here in just a couple of minutes we'll be speaking of course to our guest about some of the things that could impact the markets that's euro dollar and of course a European integration also smart conversations continue right here on Bloomberg surveillance early edition later this I will speak exclusively to the former ECB president, Jean-Claude Trichet, so you can send in your questions today already on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. that it will take some time to get inflation down because as you know there's other things going on in the economy that are adding to price pressures including the commodity price increases and energy price increases that are happening um, as well so I think inflation will remain above 2% this year and even next year but the trajectory will be that it will be moving down well, that was Loretta Mester there, Cleveland Fed president. She's confident the U.S. will avoid a recession as the Fed tightens monetary policy. Now, Mester is, of course, a voting member of the FOMC this year. So the relentless rise in U.S. Treasury yields has continued to send waves through global markets as investors adjust to an increasingly hawkish Fed. William de Vilder, chief economist at BNP Paribas, is still with us. So, William, when you look at, first of all, thank you so much for braving the sun this time and not the wind like we had on Friday for staying with, with us. When you look at what Treasuries are doing today, what are they looking at? And actually, U.S. real yields in the U.S. could turn positive. What does that tell us? 
What it tells is that the market is convinced that the Fed is going to be very aggressive, and that ties in with the messaging that has been given in recent weeks. Uh, people compare themselves now with uh, Volcker, and that's a very strong um, signal, of course. Uh, whether it gives you comfort from a um, growth perspective in the course of 2023, that's another story, of course. Yeah, but so do you worry, actually, that this could plunge the U.S. into recession, or are we looking at a soft landing? Well, we know the history shows that there has been one soft landing in 1995, and all the rest have been uh, tougher uh, experiences. <laughs> Um, another point which is good to keep in mind is that economists uh, do a very poor job in forecasting recessions several yeah. quarters out. Why? And that means that because I think psychology plays a fundamental role. At a certain moment, households that have money to spend stop spending. Uh, companies that still have good cash flow that stop investing. And why is that? Of course, because confidence drops. And that's, I'm a firm believer in, the, in this uh, psychology. Now, what is important to keep in mind is that as of the end of this year, all the talk will be about the disinflation in 2023. That is going to be the dominating topic because there's going to be a drop off in inflation because of base effects, because of slower demand growth and what have you. William, do you see the same thing this time? I mean, we're also uh, after, you know, two years of COVID where people have not spent, where there's, I guess, pent up demand and people want to go out and, and, and burn some cash. So that with rising inflation, like how will these two opposing views actually crystallize? Well, in the aggregate, uh, inflation is kind of taken on board. Uh, I'm also concerned about the more heterogeneous aspects. Uh, in, uh, that is that if you think, for instance, on excess savings in France, for instance, yeah. the bulk of the excess savings was with the higher income parts um, yeah. of the income distribution. So the less well off, uh, they will suffer. And also, I think what you can, exp what you can expect is that in terms of uh, deploying these excess savings, if at all that happens, that people will still become more uh, attentive to uh, perhaps finding a cheaper deal. All right, William, don't go anywhere because we'll talk about China. Next, over in China, Shanghai recorded over 26,000 new COVID infections yesterday as the country's largest outbreak continues to spread. Now, the rising cost of fuel, meanwhile, is adding to soaring factory prices, putting pressure on manufacturers already strained by COVID lockdowns. We're joined for more by our chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Kern, in Hong Kong. Enda, good morning. So talk us through exactly what's happening in Shanghai. Well, Francine, Shanghai remains under a very strict lockdown there. And like you mentioned, cases, cases continue to soar. We are, of course, seeing reports from our own colleagues on social media about the level of disruption that's imposing on the citizens of Shanghai. And some of that disruption is showing up now in the official data. We had inflation data today, which showed an uptick in consumer prices to 1.5%. Uh, that's obviously nowhere near the scale of uh, the increase in the US, for example, but it was much higher than expected. And it represented a 17% uptick, for example, in the price of vegetables. And people are saying that reflects the kind of disruption to the food supply chain in China on the back of the aggressive measures to contain COVID. So some some signs of the, uh, the COVID lockdown showing up and consumer inflation. Producer prices also increased today, by the way. That reflected a big jump in oil prices, less of a China story. However, when you consider the pressures that consumers or the producers are now under also trying to manage these COVID lockdowns, rising prices will also add uh, to the problems they're facing. So when you take it together, rising inflation and COVID lockdowns, obviously you're looking at more pressure on China's economy and making the task even harder to meet that 5.5% growth target. Enda, thank you so much. Our chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Kern, there. William, when you look at how world economists actually look at China, are we underestimating the disruption that could come from that, or will PBOC be there to support it? Well, if there is support, uh, which we would expect to happen, is going to be domestic support and to cushion the blow to households uh, for the global economy, that will not be helpful. Uh, it will only be helpful very indirectly. So the key point is that we are facing is that the uh, delivery times are lengthening again in March after improving in, July, in January, February, and uh, that may very well continue. What we're experiencing in the world economy now is a combination of shocks, which is quite unique. Yep. Fortunately, by the way, you have a health shock that is still uh, going on. Uh, you have a commodity shock, you have a geopolitical shock, and you have a monetary shock. So how many punches can you take on the chin? That's the key question that we're facing. Say, how does that not plunge us into a recession then? 
Well, the reason is that uh, if you look at the, let's say, the glove is half full uh, perspective, that is that you can argue the demand aspects of China, that's really domestic. U.S. for the time being, it's pretty domestic. We do, we're not yet in the face of spillovers from fat biting to the rest of the world. Even the health shock has become very domestic in China. Geopolitics, that's Europe's issue. So what you have is that um, it's like every region of the world has its own specific shocks. I know, but put together, William, I've always been an optimist. And then, to, you know, today I'm starting to wonder some of the price valuations on the markets. Is that fair? Um, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> you're a half-past full my, person. My, uh, <laughs> my take is that uh, for me, market timing, that's really recession spotting. And uh, that's the, for me, the only thing that counts. And uh, we are not there yet. Um, we, uh, a lot of people have talked about the flattening of the U.S. curve. But on the other hand, if you look at the short end of the curve, that's steepening. So they were still kind of taken yeah. on board. And that's my point why it's so important to think about the disinflation 2023 story yes. that will come at the end of the year. Yeah, and I feel like also the end of the year is when energy prices are going to be much harder to, of course, manage because of the stockpiles that will have been released in the meantime and harsher yeah. winter. Cross your fingers. Crossy, I know. <laughs> All right. I'll, this is a date. I'm going to speak to William at the end of the year, hopefully many times before then, but at the end of the year, we'll take stock and we'll see the optimist versus the pessimist. I've never been a pessimist in my life. We'll see who's right. William DeVilder, their chief economist at BNP Paribas, joining us on a pretty sunny, almost too sunny uh, Paris Terrace. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. A little bit later this hour, we also speak exclusively to the former ECB president, Jean-Claude Trichet. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Russian troops will turn to even more large-scale actions in the east of our country, may use even more missiles and air bombs against us. President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky there saying he expects Russian forces to widen their offensive on Ukraine. Now, I say on that story, and EU foreign ministers are due to meet in Luxembourg today to discuss further sanctions against Moscow. Bloomberg's Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo is in Luxembourg for us. So, Maria, EU sanctions on Russian coal have been approved. What kind of sanctions could we see next? Yeah, Francine, and they were just approved on Friday, but the conversation here is what happens next. They're already prepping the next package. All of this, as you said, in anticipation for what they believe will be renewed fighting in the east of Ukraine. Now, in terms of where we go uh, from here, well, Francine, at this point, it is very clear that there's not much left they can sanction unless they go into oil and gas. For the time being, gas is simply a no-go, but oil could be debated today. We know that a number of countries will try to put it uh, on the table. A lot of this, as I said, in anticipation of that attack in the Donbass. Now, the Ukrainians say they believe that Russia will double down in the region. In many ways, this is a place where it all started. And the pressure is on, on both sides to try to really score a big military victory. For Russia, of course, it's uh, the clock ticking ahead of Victory Day on May 9th. For the Ukrainians, they really believe that if they're able to repel a Russian attack on the east, then that will give them leverage and a stronger position going into those talks. Remember, Francine, for the time being, the talks could continue, but both sides are kind of just waiting for that uh, battle for the Donbass before they actually get and sit down in the real negotiating uh, table. So a lot yeah. of this will depend on the outcome of this battle, which, as I said, you know, the Ukrainians expect could happen imminently. Uh, Maria, the Austrian chancellor also will meet Vladimir Putin in Moscow today. What can we expect from that? Yeah, Francine, and there's a lot of nervousness about this trip because this is done on a personal capacity. This is a chancellor who's been on the job for about two months, not a lot of foreign policy uh, credentials. We know how those meetings with Vladimir Putin can go. We know press conferences uh, with Vladimir Putin can be a total uh, car sh crash for, for unexperienced uh, political leaders. But I just spoke with the foreign minister of Austria, and he told me they're still standing by this trip. They're defending the trip. They say that the chancellor will give him a clear message that the war needs to end that uh, Ukraine needs a humanitarian corridor and all of this is happening on a personal basis. But Austria says any voice that can help perhaps de-escalate tensions is important and should be welcomed. 
Uh, Maria, talk to me a little bit about that very important Ursula von der Leyen visit to, to Kyiv on Friday, where at some point she also hands a piece of paper to the president of Ukraine for, uh, you know, access to the EU. Is this just on technical terms because then it's up to the leaders? And is there appetite, real appetite from leaders to make the Ukraine part of the EU? Yes, Francine, and, and remember, she went to uh, Kyiv, that video of the two of them gone completely viral uh, on social media, again, representing in the eyes of the European Union that unity that the EU has when it comes to Ukraine. But you're very right. We know that this is a divisive issue for European leaders, some who believe after all the fighting, after everything that Ukraine and the Ukrainian people in particular have gone through, they should be given a path to membership. Others believe that ultimately this is a war. It's going to be very difficult. Thank you so much, our Maria Tadeo there in Luxembourg for us. Now, Smart Conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we speak exclusively to the former ECB president, Jean-Claude Trichet. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Advantage Macron, the first round of the French presidential election, gives the incumbent a narrow lead. We'll see what happens on April 24th. The surge in Treasury yields sends ripples across global markets. The benchmark 10-year yield rises to 2.75% for the first time since 2019. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we speak exclusively to the former ECB president, Jean-Claude Trichet. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, first thing is first, let's check on the markets. My colleague Danny Berger is in London. Danny, what do you have? It really is a market dominated by the bond action, Francine. Look, the sell-off in Treasuries, it's not as acute as it was when I first came in this morning some hours ago, but still we're looking at 10-year yields that are higher by about five basis points. You mentioned this, the highest since 2019 is 3% the next target on this. As we look towards CPI, PPI, a lot of inflation data this week. Now, that's having an impact on equity markets. Stocks in Europe down 7 tenths of 1%, a decline in U.S. stocks, NASDAQ down more than 1%. And the yen, another casualty of this move in bonds, the Japanese U.S. bond differential means that we're looking at the yen at its weakest since 2015. Finally, you should also point NYMEX crude on there, down more than 2%. That off the back of weakening mobility data in China. What does that mean for demand? Now, the one bright spot in this European market are French equities, with most of the regional benchmarks falling. The Cacarone is flat. And let me show you what's leading this higher. SockGen, the highest returning stock so far this morning in the stock 600 as with BNP. So French banks doing well, a little bit of dip buying there with Macron leading in the polls. But SockGen also has its own idiosyncratic story that's allowing it to gain more than 5%. Uh, SockGen, for its part, has said that it's disposing of its Russian assets. It's selling down its share in Rosneft to Russia's wealthiest man, the firm owned by him. Finally, Rhine Metall, a little bit related here as well. Of course, the uh, German defense company has rallied 150 percent this year, considering there's more defense spending from European nations. Well, the news this morning, the U.K. exercising an option to buy 100 Boxer armored cars. That's sending Rheinmetall higher to be the second best performing stock in the stock 600 this morning, Francine. Danny, thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there with the stocks we need to watch and some of the asset classes as well. Now, President Emmanuel Macron is set to face his nationalist rival, Marine Le Pen, in the final round of the French election in a rerun of their 2017 contest. The game isn't over, and the debate that we will have in the coming 15 days is decisive for our country and for Europe. All those who today didn't vote for Emmanuel Macron should join our movement. Well, Jean-Claude Trichet was president of the European Central Bank from 2003 to 2011, governor of the Banque de France from 1993 to 2003, and before that, undersecretary at the French Treasury. Now, in these positions, he was instrumental in pursuing the French strategy of competitive disinflation in the 1980s and 1990s. Well, Jean-Claude Trichet joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us. I have a million questions on game theory, on who will become president, things like that. But first of all, are the markets too complacent? It seems like Marine Le Pen has momentum in her campaign, and 
actually this time she could become president. Yeah, I think uh, nobody has really looked at the program of the various candidates, obviously. Uh, it was uh, more or less under, under the screening okay. of uh, uh, everybody. So we will see what happens now that yeah. the program will be screened very, very cautiously. What do, do you think Marine Le Pen stands for? I mean, uh, we understand that she's no longer advocating a Frexit, but she's still anti-immigration, anti-globalization. So what does it mean for the economy of this country? Well, she's anti-globalization, of course, anti-Europe. Even if she didn't say that uh, she would call for Frexit or she would call for uh, abandoning the euro because she understood that it was not a winner at all. No. But still, of course, she's not at all pro-European. She was very close to uh, Russia and to President Putin, which is more or less the, I would say, attitude of the extreme right uh, in Europe, in all, all European countries, close to Putin. So, again, it, is, it would be a major, major political strategy change for France and for Europe. Yeah, this would be almost like an earthquake when it comes to European politics. Give us a sense of why her campaign has been gaining so much momentum. She's focused on the cost of living, on taking care of, of the ones that are suffering the most from inflation. Can Emmanuel Macron counter that? He, he's done a bit, actually, to try and, and, you know, make that burden a little bit more livable. No, the problem in France with this system where you have 12 candidates, but only two are making up for the second round, you have an immense uh, power, if I may, or influence of strategic vote, or useful vote, as yeah. uh, we say in yeah. France, vote utile. Sure. And of course, it concentrates the votes of a certain constituency, and we have three major constituencies in France. When you make all the accounting, yeah. you see 32% extreme right. Uh, sovereignist, uh, anti-European, and so forth. You have 32 left, uh, a very few, unfortunately, in many respects, I would say, social democrat left, but you have also a lot of, uh, I would say, radical left, obviously, and Greens, but the same percentage, 32, and the centrist, Macronist, pro-European, pro-market economy are representing also 32. I mean, the, the lesson of, the, of, of the, the election is really a division of the country between the three. So, Trichet, this means that it's going to be very difficult for Emmanuel Macron to be president without any doubt of his losing, because he doesn't have that buffer that he enjoyed in 2017. There was a lot of people having that anger vote, right, that, you know, either voted for Éric Zemmour, for Marine Le Pen, or even Jean-Luc Mélenchon. At this stage, one thing is absolutely sure, it will be a close call, a very close call. And uh, one can understand that because everything remains on the translation of the voters of the left, whether they will go as the leaders of the left are calling for, not to vote on Le Pen implicitly or explicitly to vote for Macron, will they follow this, uh, I would say, uh, recommendation or uh, whether they would sp split their votes? If they split their votes, it's an extremely cold call, close call. If they do not, then I would say there is a good chance, of course, that Macron will win with some margin. So right now, do you worry about voters not going to vote, so the abstention? And how many people are still undecided that Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen will try and win over in the next two weeks? I think that a lot of people would, and this is new, accept that after all, all taken into account, even after the war in Ukraine, uh, Le Pen would be right. a possible yeah. president. I think that it is not the majority uh, view, but it's, it's a strong view, which we had not five years ago. Uh, that being said, again, a, a very tough campaign is now coming in. The president did not really campaign before for many reasons, including the fact that when you have 11 candidates that are against you, it's uh, very difficult to campaign correctly. But in the second round, it's one-to-one, uh, -one, yes, and I yeah. expect that uh, the, the I would say campaign will be very tough, and, uh, and we will see exactly what happens. But I take it that normally, also taking into account the, the recommendations of the left, yeah. Macron should win.
Uh, Monsieur Trichet, thank you so much. I mean, we'll see if he really is managing to galvanize his campaign. Of course, Emmanuel Macron uh, being considered by many French too elitist and a president for the rich. So we'll manage, we'll see if he manages actually to shake that off. Jean-Claude Trichet, former ECB president and Banque de France governor, stays with us. We'll talk a lot more about these rising yields. We'll talk about the U.S. Treasuries and, of course, inflation globally. Coming up, we have more reaction for Mr. Trichet on the first round results of the French presidential election. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Marine Le Pen doing her victory speech in the first round here, as if she had almost already won this election. Le peuple français s'est exprimé et me fait l'honneur d'être qualifié au second tour face au président sortant. The first round results uh, this Sunday show that Emmanuel Macron got about 28% of the votes and Marine Le Pen, the far-right contender, about 24% of the votes. So they will face each other in a runoff in two weeks' time on April 24. There's still a lot of things that Marine Le Pen needs to do in order to win this election because in the past you've always had a Republican front going on for the second round of a presidential election, a anything but the extreme. Tonight Marine Le Pen has called all the French who didn't vote for Emmanuel Macron to vote for her. She would need to gather, of course, the far-right electorate of Eric Zemmour, this candidate who initially was a division in the far right, but then has managed to make her more look more mainstream because he was taking all the radical views on immigration and on Europe. So she appeared more normal and she managed, thanks to Eric Zemmour, to gather a bigger electorate. She also needs uh, to uh, get some of the hard left voters, this electorate of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who actually did a very good score tonight, about 20% of the votes. Il ne faut pas donner une seule voix à Madame Le Pen. Il ne faut pas donner une seule voix à Madame Le Pen. And uh, finally, she needs the center left voters of Emmanuel Macron to stay home in the second round. She needs the level of attention to benefit her uh, for this second round. The biggest challenge for Emmanuel Macron will be to appear close to the French. Marine Le Pen has had this strategy of traveling up and down the country, meeting with the French. Unlike Emmanuel Macron, who was too busy because of the war in Ukraine on the diplomatic front, she has cast herself as the president of the little ones versus Emmanuel Macron, the president of the rich. So Emmanuel Macron needs to refocus his campaign on this issue of inflation, which has become the number one concern of the French before immigration, before the war in Ukraine, and before healthcare issues. There will be a debate in between the two rounds on April 20 between Emmanuel Macron, uh, the current French president, and Marine Le Pen. Last time, in 2017, Marine Le Pen wasn't very good in this debate. So this is a chance for Emmanuel Macron to regain control of this election after some polls actually showed a very tight dress for the second line happening on April 24. 
Bloomberg's Caroline Conan, they are reporting on the first round of the French presidential election. She was, of course, posted at Marine Le Pen's headquarters all evening. Now, let's get back to Jean-Claude Trichet. He's former ECB president and Banque de France governor. Uh, Monsieur Trichet, I want to talk about inflation worldwide. But first, in the next two weeks, what should be the strategy of each candidate? Is there, uh, you know, can Emmanuel Macron refocus on the ties that Marine Le Pen has had, for example, with Russia? And do the French citizens care? Well, I, I expect both candidates, of course, to concentrate on the weak points of their adversary. Uh, the weak point of Macron is that he was in power for five years. Yes. And the experience in France uh, shows to which extent this is a handicap, because you have to renew yeah. your uh, own future and uh, expect, explain why you are doing better in the second term. Uh, now, uh, of course, uh, Madame Le Pen has a lot of uh, weakness also, and uh, the main weakness is certainly uh, anti to be anti-European, to be close to Russia and Putin, and uh, to, I would say, have a program which is not financed. There's a big repricing when it comes to Treasuries. The 10-year U.S. yield, 2.75 percent. So it's getting higher. How difficult is it at the moment for policymakers to deal with inflation without tipping us into recession? You've lived us through this. Yeah, I, I think that what is absolutely decisive, of course, is to continue to solidly anchor inflation expectations. If you solidly anchor inflation expectations, whatever happens with the hump of inflation, which is due to price of oil and commodity and gas and so forth, which is the case on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, but if, if you keep on, under control, and it, it relies entirely upon your credibility. And the yeah. problem is to preserve credibility of the Fed on the one hand, of the ECB on the other hand, in a very, very difficult circumstance. I mean, as soon as you say anchoring inflation expectations, it brings me way back. It's like, you know, the, the fuzzy feeling when I used to uh, cover all of your press conferences. Yeah. This yeah. is different because there's a supply shock. Yeah. There's a big supply shock coming from Ukraine and Russia. True. So how do you navigate this? True, true. We had also supply shocks in my time, I have to say. You know, uh, when it's I left, the, the last, my last year, we had 4% of headline. Yeah. And 4% of headline means, of course, that you have a supply shock and the, the price of commodities are picking up much too uh, violently. Uh, but the problem, again, is to maintain the uh, second round effects yes. under control. And you have them under control if everybody is convinced that in any case, over the medium run, you will uh, supply, if I may, 2%. Yes. Uh, which, is, but, which is the common goal uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. But how much of a headache is this now for Europe? So we went, to, we started the year in saying, look, there's an inflation problem in the U.S. There are cyclical effects in the U.S. that we don't have here in Europe. And suddenly, because of the proximity to China, the proximity to Ukraine and Russia and the reliance on Russian oil and gas, it's a huge headache here that came up and cropped up violently. You're absolutely true. Uh, we had already before the war in Ukraine, a very big, big problem of uh, price of oil commodity, uh, agricultural product, yeah. which were much too high. And then we have, and of course, Europe is really at stake, this war in Ukraine and the dependency on oil and gas coming from, uh, from Russia. So again, I think that we are more or less in the same situation now on both sides of the Atlantic because of this uh, new hump of headline inflation due to the war. That being said, until now, inflation expectations were much better anchored in Europe than in the US. Uh, up to now, I have to say, the core inflation in Europe was much lower. We, we were at 2.9 percent in yeah. the euro area, 6 percent in the US. So big difference big before difference. the full impact of the war. Yes, and a difficult, I guess, you know, cyclical moment also for the economy. Yeah. Talk to us about sequencing that the ECB needs to make sure that the markets get right. <laughs> I, I have full confidence in the governing council of the ECB, so okay. I have no recommendations for them. But I would say the last decision they took were clearly mentioning the fact that they were very, very cautious, prudent, and wanted to signal that they would not remain excessively accommodating if there was an incurring of inflation expectations. So I trust them to continue to have this attitude, which is very important for markets, participants, for every, every uh, I would say, economic agents and for the social partners. They have to count on medium-term 2%. 
we're also seeing in China with concerns about growth, but also concerns about the COVID zero policy and what that means for trade. Is the Fed now the central bank to the world? No, <laughs> no more than before. Uh, of course, it is, uh, the, the dollar is very important, no doubt. Proportion is one to three between the euro and the dollar. But I would not say that he changes everything. Do, do you think the dollar dominance, because of what we're seeing in Russia and some of the sanctions, will slowly dwindle as more countries try and get away from it? In the very long term, there is always a drawback with uh, sanctions. And it is true that uh, the United States has to be careful in practicing sanctions, including, I have to say, uh, freezing the assets of central banks. That, that is something because which would I would fire. not have recommended myself, yeah. frankly speaking. B because but, it but would that, backfire longer term or because yeah, the second round effects are too big? Because a number of other central banks would say, ho oh, oh, ho, I'm not that sure that uh, I can. So there, there is something there which is extremely delicate and has yeah. to be, I would say, priced in yeah. the decisions in uh, Washington. Uh, Monsieur Trichet, thank you so much as always for joining us. That was Jean-Claude Trichet, the former ECB president Merci. and Banque de France governor, joining us right here in Paris. Coming up, Rishi Sunak under pressure. The UK's chancellor faces scrutiny over his wife's tax status. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at the front pages of some of the UK papers now, the Financial Times and Guardian leading with the French election. But the other big story in the UK is a scandal surrounding the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. Now, he's asked for a formal inquiry into his own financial interests. That's after it emerged that his wife took advantage of a legal tax loophole. Now, to let's get more on all of this with Bloomberg's Leanne Guerin. So, Leanne, how precarious is Sunak's job right now? Good morning, Francine. And that's a question on everybody's lips this Monday morning. And it's really damage control for Chancellor Rishi Sunak at the moment. He has requested personally that this investigation goes ahead into his finances. And this comes after we found out last week that his wife, Akshata Murphy, is a non-domicile, meaning she wasn't paying UK tax on the money she was earning outside of the country. And this comes at a time when the Chancellor Rishi Sunak has really been seen to raise taxes here in the UK. A lot of families are paying more tax than they ever did in decades. And the fact that we have now found out that his wife wasn't paying all the tax required due to her non-dom status, which is not illegal, but it is also not a good look for Rishi Sunak. Now, Rishi Sunak was tipped to be the next prime minister when Boris Johnson was going through the Partygate scandal here in in the UK and his personal polls were really surging. We have seen those plummet now, but there's damaging, there's damage control in Downing Street as he tries to claw back some of his popularity. Leanne, thank you so much. That was Bloomberg's Leanne Gerens. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kay Lines in New York and Edwards here in London. And I'll be bringing you the very latest from Paris. This is Bloomberg. Are certainly a lot of moving parts that have created a lot of price volatility. It picks up, it slows down, but a real true recession we just don't see right now. Barring adverse developments, I think we have a little bit of breathing room for the equity markets. Unfortunately, we're not in the perfect world. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Macron and Le Pen are set for a runoff election in France. It's a vote that will reverberate across Europe. Ukraine expects Russia to widen its offensive in the eastern part of the country. Meanwhile, a new Russian ground commander is raising alarm. 
And Elon Musk turns down the chance to join Twitter's board. That renews speculation about the company's future. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines over in New York. And Kaylee, uh, the focus for markets on the higher yield environment, on the data out of China and on French politics. Yeah, and all of it adding up to what was a very, very risk off day in Asia overnight. Broad selling across the board, but a lot of the pain was centered in Hong Kong and China specifically and specifically within technology. The Hang Seng Tech Index fell more than 5%, while the broader CSI 300 in China was down by about 3%. And we actually had reporting uh, out just about an hour ago from Bloomberg saying that Chinese authorities actually stepped in to try to stem the bleeding, uh, stopping mutual funds from selling some shares, but it didn't actually uh, translate into much of uh, relief for those stocks, which were down pretty hard. Of course, you have a lot of factors at play in that. You have a consistent regulatory overhang on technology, but also a lot of macroeconomic concerns. You have continued lockdowns in Shanghai, other areas of the country due to a COVID-19 outbreak. What does that mean for growth? And of course, that also exacerbates inflation. We saw that in the factory gate inflation data overnight, 8.3% higher than expected. I wanted to point to the Chinese 10-year bond yield as well. 277 is where we sit uh, currently. At one point in the session, that actually surpassed that of the 10-year Treasury yield for the first time since 2010. And as we see Treasury yields climbing, that is once again putting pressure on the Japanese yen. Back through 125 against the dollar mat, weakest since 2015. Yeah, watching that yen and also that Chinese inflation. Of course, we have our own inflation numbers coming out on Tuesday. Um, what we're really seeing today is the effect of yields, the 10-year right now at 275, basically, on stocks. S&P futures down about half a percent, a little bit more, and getting lower and lower as we head towards the open. NYMEX crude right now um, down about two uh, and a third percent, 95.93 a barrel for Texas Intermediate. So that may be uh, good news for U.S. stocks, but still we're watching that yield, that 10-year yield and real yields continuing to climb. Bitcoin right now down as well, uh, more than two percent, 42,183. And the question is, um, how closely correlated is Bitcoin really to the S&P 500, to the NASDAQ 100? The concern is that it's very correlated and we could see a correction coming. So, Anna, um, European markets, are they telling a different story than what we're seeing here? European markets are broadly nervous about the higher yield environment that you've just mentioned there, Matt. And we are seeing moves here in Europe that really uh, sit, sit very well with what we're seeing on U.S. futures. And in fact, the, the European session has been moving up and down with that U.S. futures picture connected to the higher yield environment in the United States. There are other stories we need to focus on here, though, in Europe. And one of those is France. This has been a really volatile market this morning. The CAC 40 has been positive, then negative, then positive again. And it is, of course, about the French election. But it is also about what we're hearing from Societe Generale. So here's CAC 40 up by four tenths of one percent right now. Socgen, one of the French, uh, the French market's biggest banks, they have announced what they're going to do with their French assets. They're managing to sell them uh, to uh, Vladimir Petonin, who is a very lightly sanctioned uh, Russian uh, billionaire, and he's going to be buying these assets. The fact that they're actually managing to sell Russian assets at this point, and they're sticking to their buyback plans and their dividend plans, that being well received by the market, that stock up by uh, nearly six percent. It has been a little higher. I put the French 10-year yield in here as well because we did see this yield uh, moving a, a little bit lower in the very early start of trade in response to the French election the fact that maybe Emmanuel Macron did better than some had expected him to uh, even if that race now looks interesting over the next couple of weeks more on that in a moment but now in the last few hours we have seen the French markets kind of fall in line with the broader international picture and one that the German market is reflecting here and that is a higher yield environment let me show you what's going on in Russian assets last week we saw a six percent con uh, contraction or retraction in the uh, stock market over in Russia. Today we see moves higher at seven tenths of one percent. Uh, the ruble continues to refine its feet, really. Capital controls limiting the damage to the ruble after we saw it uh, jump out to what, 177, I think, to the dollar now around the 80 ballpark. So not all that far from where we were when we saw the start of the war. Uh, keeping an eye on what's going on with Russian death, of course, Russian CDS. Uh, as we saw, the Russian finance minister said that they will take legal action if it is sanctions that mean that they have to default on their debt. Of course, they say they haven't defaulted. Uh, we will wait to see how other bodies, other agencies decide the Russians have behaved uh, in terms of yeah. their debt payments, Kaylee. Well, and we're getting news on that right now, Anna. We just had a breaking headline that Russian Railways has been declared in default. Uh, a CDS panel has ruled that's the credit derivatives determination 
Determinations Committee uh, saying that insurance contracts for that will now be triggered and paid out to holders after the company missed a coupon payment last month. So again, Russian Railways is in default. It'll be interesting to see how many potentially will follow. Now let's take a look at what is ahead this week. Today we have EU foreign ministers meeting in Luxembourg with additional measures against Moscow on the agenda. Then on Tuesday, we'll get the all important US CPI data. On Wednesday, JP Morgan will be kicking off Wall Street earnings with many big banks to follow. We'll also get the ECB rate decision on Thursday. And finally, rounding us out on Friday, Matt, US industrial production data. All right, we're watching that data very closely this week. Um, over in France, Emmanuel Macron set to face his nationalist rival Marine Le Pen in the final round of the French presidential election. Snap polls taken after voting ended gave the 44 year old president a narrow advantage heading into the runoff on April 24th. The candidate spoke last night. I wish to extend a hand to all those who want to work for France. All those who today didn't vote for Emmanuel Macron should join our movement. They're able to decide what's good for the country. Never lose your faith in democracy. So you must not give a voice to Madame Le Pen. I'm calling on my electors to vote for Marine Le Pen. The game isn't over, and the debate that we will have in the coming 15 days is decisive for our country and for Europe. Bloomberg, Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix is leading our coverage in Paris right now, and the world is watching, Francine. Right. Markets have taken this as good news. Is there a danger? Well, I think there's a danger of complacency, Matt. There's a danger that actually the markets look at the runoff between Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron and see a repeat of 2017. But actually, we're in a very different situation. First of all, Marine Le Pen is stronger when it comes to the economy. She's tapped into something that is extremely important, which is the high cost of living, inflation, and how she intends to actually protect the blue-collar workers, whereas Emmanuel Macron is really considered out of touch, uh, a present for the rich and for the elite. The other thing is because Emmanuel Macron has been in charge for five years, it will be much more difficult for him to have the buffer. So April 24th, the two candidates have a runoff, but I think polls will be extremely tight. Uh, Francine, when we look at the number of votes that went to Marine Le Pen and the number that went to Eric Zemmour, what does it tell us about deep divisions within France? Yeah, the divisions are deep because you can call them the anger votes, but you also take Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who did 20 percent, the third candidate with the most votes, he's far left. And what we found out in the last four to five years is that there is more of a link between far right, far right and far left than there had been in the past. So the traditional left-right divide is now out the window, and it's more of a vote of establishment and anti-establishment. And that really cemented in what we've seen over the last four to five years. What will be crucial on April 24th, it will be turnout. We have a TV debate on April 20th. It'll be interesting to see uh, both sides try to attack each other on various things. I suspect that Marine Le Pen will say Emmanuel Macron is out of touch because he only takes care of the people that are wealthy. I suspect uh, by speaking to campaign uh, managers on both sides that Emmanuel Macron will go after her close ties with Vladimir Putin in the past. So it will be a, an interesting and definitely not dull campaign in the next two weeks. All right, Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua in Paris. Thank you so much. Speaking of Vladimir Putin and Russia and the war in Ukraine, let's get the latest there now. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he expects Russian forces to widen their offensive in the east of the country as they abandon parts of the north. He spoke yesterday. Russian troops will turn to even more large-scale actions in the east of our country, may use even more missiles and air bombs against us. Let's get to our team coverage now with Maria Tadeo, our European correspondent who's in Luxembourg, where EU foreign ministers are meeting today, and Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent with us from D.C. Maria, let's start with you. Give us the latest on your side of the Atlantic. Well, Kaylee, we have uh, European foreign ministers today. They just approved a new package of sanctions, but they're already working on the potential new one that could maybe include oil. We know that's being debatable. Having said that, getting that on paper will be very uh, difficult. We know that this continues to be a very divisive issue. But all of this is happening in anticipation of what is being framed as a battle for Donbass. Both sides, Russia and Ukraine, prepping for a major battle. There's two issues here, of course, for the Russian President Vladimir Putin 
thinking he is fast approaching victory day. That's May 9th. He needs to be able to show his public on the Red Square that he's achieved something that is the date in which the big Soviet victory over Nazi Germany celebrated. And remember, this operation is happening in the context of a denazifying operation. That's what the Kremlin says. When it comes to Ukraine, they feel that if they're able to repel the Russians on the east, then that will give them a lot more leverage and a lot more power when it comes to the real talks. Remember, the Ukrainians say they won't actually sit down and talk seriously until there's a ceasefire. They believe the best way to achieve this is by really going after Russia in the east. OK, so that's what's happening on the ground. In terms of talks, in terms of who is talking to whom then, Maria, Austria's chancellor will meet with President Vladimir Putin in Moscow today, we understand, in an attempt to build dialogue as the war in Ukraine continues. Uh, the Austrian foreign minister, Alexander Schallenberg, spoke to Bloomberg earlier, and here's what was said. If we can do anything to stop this humanitarian hell that is happening in Ukraine, we will do so. Do we expect miracles? No, we don't. But we cannot tell ourselves that we left a chance unused, that we left a stone unturned if we could have done so. Uh, Maria, so we expect this visit by uh, the Austrian Chancellor today, not somebody with uh, such a high profile around uh, the European political scene. What can Karl uh, Nehammer, the, uh, the, 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 the Chancellor of Austria, what can he hope to achieve? Look, Anna, the way I see it, there's very little upside from this meeting and a lot of things can go wrong here. When you look at the Austrian chancellor, he's been in the job for two months, doesn't have a lot of uh, foreign policy credentials. When it comes to Vladimir Putin, we know those meetings can be very difficult and in particular, the press conferences that follow can be brutal. This has a lot of potential uh, to go wrong. The Austrians, nonetheless, they say that this is a, a peace mission, that they're doing this uh, to try to show Vladimir Putin that he's very isolated in the global stage. But as I say a lot of this carries a lot of risk and today there's a lot of nervousness around this visit. I had a European official who told me this is not the time for amateurs so we'll have to wait and see what happens there. All right Maria Tadeo in Luxembourg thanks very much for that continued coverage. Now President Biden will again press India to take a harder stance on Russia's war in Ukraine during a virtual meeting with Prime Minister Narendra Modi today at 11 a.m. Eastern time. This meeting comes ahead of a dialogue between the foreign and defense minister from both sides. Let's get to Anne Marie Horder, and she is standing by in Washington. So, Anne Marie, what do we expect um, President Biden to say? Well, there's a lot of growing unease between New Delhi and Washington. Now, what we heard already from Jen Psaki, the president's press secretary over the weekend, was that President Biden will continue, in their words, our close consultations on the consequences of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine and mitigating its destabilizing impact on global food supply and commodity markets. I wanted to bring this quote up specifically because India's statement ahead of this virtual meeting does not mention Ukraine, the war in Russia, issues with commodities, wheat prices, and oil as well. And these are two of the big issues, because right now, Russia is taking in, at steep discounts, a lot of Russian crude. On top of that, they're also looking potentially for ways to pay for that crude in rubles. And then, of course, there's the fact that India is a massive military buyer from Russia. So you have two of these big issues. Behind the scenes, though, what people say is that there are a little bit of better talks about making sure India can more align with the West. But what you see in public is a lot of warnings. We saw that last week from Brian Deese, the president's top economic advisor, to India about if they have more strategic alignment with Russia. And from the Indian side, what we saw just last week was then abstaining once again when the UN General Assembly voted to oust Russia on the Human Rights Council. Anne-Marie, thanks very much. Anne-Marie Horden in Washington for us. From Washington to Tech News, Tesla founder Elon Musk has decided not to join Twitter's board. The reversal has set off speculation about the reason for Musk's decision. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny, what do we know? Well, this came about six hours ago, a tweet from CEO Parag Agrawal saying that Elon's appointment to the board was to become official effective the 9th of April. But Elon shared that same morning that he will no longer be joining the board. I believe this is for the best. So 
the day he was supposed to join the board, he doesn't. And this, again, just six hours ago, has fueled the speculation as to why he decided not to. And each of these reasons really does come with an effect, not just for Elon's holding of Twitter, Twitter itself, but also SEC action. So first off, shares have been falling pre-market. They're off some of their lows, down 4.5%, was down as much as 6%. Of course, a lot of investors love everything Elon touches. But if he had joined the board, part of the stipulation was he couldn't own more than 14.9% of Twitter. Currently, he owns around 9%. So if he's not joining the board, therefore, he'd be free to buy and acquire a much bigger state. Secondly, if he was on the board, fiduciary responsibilities would have come with that. And perhaps then he wouldn't be able to have his controversial tweets about Twitter, of which there have been many just in the past few days. And finally, Elon Musk also not only filed late about his holding to Twitter, but also first filed as a passive investor. Yeah. There's a lot of speculation that he'll find SEC scrutiny with that. And Kaylee, joining the board would have just made that all uh, a lot more complicated. All right, Bloomberg's Danny Berger, not so passive, clearly, as we've come to understand over the last week. Now, of course, as Danny mentioned, Twitter lower in pre-market trading, but Tesla, the company Elon Musk is the CEO of, also is lower. That stock is down the better part of 4% at the moment. Remember, Tesla commands a very, very high multiple. Trades at something like 93 times forward earnings. And as you're seeing Treasury yields going higher, that is putting pressure on a lot of those high multiple stocks. Uh, one of them, as well, isn't just uh, technology companies based here in the U.S., but based in China. Too. Of course, I detailed earlier the pain we saw for some of those Chinese technology stocks overnight. That is translating right through into the ADRs in free market trading this morning. Alibaba, just one example, it's down almost 4% as well. And of course, it's not just uh, technology moving lower. The energy complex is by and large as well as you're seeing oil prices put under pressure by some of the concerns around demand from China. Occidental Petroleum, one example, down about 2% before the bell, Anna. Yeah, interesting that energy stocks here in Europe are flat, uh, Kaylee, but we do have technology moving substantially lower, down by more than 2% in the European session. What does Sharon Bell, European equity strategist at Goldman Sachs, what does she make of the technology space as we see yields go higher? That's certainly part of the story here in Europe and looks to be part of the story as we move into the US day as well, uh, day as well with Nasdaq futures weaker. And on to the French runoff, we will talk to Dublin, uh, Douglas Weber, INSEAD, Professor of Political Science. We'll get perspective on what we've heard so far and have yet to still hear from Paris. Plus, trouble getting off the ground, billions of dollars, and a decade later, an Amazon's delivery by drone program continues to be plagued by crashes and safety concerns. Read more on today's Big Take by typing NI Big Take into your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on both radio and television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lines. Anna Edwards is with us again in London, reunited, and it feels so good. I'm looking at a uh, credit <laughs> chart right now that doesn't make you feel good if you're long, if you've been long. Obviously, it was a horrible first quarter for credit. Really, across the board, for those of you listening on radio, we're showing uh, treasuries, corporate debt, um, govies, uh, global act securitized debt. Um, all of it had just an awful first three months. Dana Albaltaji joins us now, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Credit, to talk about what we can expect in Q2 and going forward, Dana, especially with the run-up in rates that we've seen in the 10-year. Um, what does this mean at 275 for the rest of credit? Hi. So basically, I think you should expect more of the same. You know, the narrative hasn't really changed. Yes, we had Russia and it blew th and, and, and and it blew up markets, but right now the discussion really is about rates and rising rates. And that is not going to go away. Inflation is still very high, and you should expect to see bond yields to still be rising. What's really interesting about that chart, though, is the pace of the fall. The pace of the fall has been so frantic. I mean, if you look at that chart really carefully, you'll see that it was falling from the end of July, beginning of August. But since the beginning of this year, it's just been absolutely frantic. Mm. And where would you stand on the good morning to you, Where do we stand on the real yields uh, story right now? Because we've uh, seen them in negative territory for so long, and all of these fast moves in nominal yields actually taking us back up to, 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 to territory we haven't seen for some time, and that's positive. And that's exactly it. I mean, I think what, what we are seeing is a return to a normal that we had back in 2009, 2019, and 2000. And 
18. The thing is, is that while we did expect this, I mean, of course, rates are rising and you would expect yields to rise and therefore the real yield to go into positive territory. What we did not expect is how fast that is all happening. Mm. And the question is whether or not the corporates out there and whether the people out there are actually ready for this sort of pace. Yeah, absolutely. The pace of change quite frantic then. Adana, thank you very much. Dana el uh, joining us there with the latest on rates markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your terminal. This is Bling Bang. It's a Monday morning that follows a weekend of golf. Scotty Shetler is the new Masters champion. He won the tournament by three shots over Rory McIlroy. Shetler has won four of the last six tournaments that he's played. Meanwhile, Tiger Woods finished 23 shots back. It was his first tournament since an auto accident that almost cost him his right leg and his life. At times, he used a golf club like a cane for support. And we understand that Tiger Woods being back in the tournament actually was a big boost to viewership, uh, according to ESPN. Now, Coming up, we will get away from sports back to the market. Sharon Bell, European equity strategist at Goldman Sachs, will be joining us on this Risk Off Monday morning. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. In France, President Emmanuel Macron and nationalist Marine Le Pen are headed for a runoff in the presidential election. It's a rerun of their 2017 contest that will reverberate across Europe. Macron received 27.6% of the vote in Sunday's first round, compared with 23.4% for Le Pen. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky expects Russia to turn to even more large-scale action this week in the eastern part of the country. He has been warned warning for days of a new Russian offensive. And it's another twist in the week-long saga of Twitter and Elon Musk. Twitter says the world's richest person has decided not to join its board after all. Uh, that touched off a renewed speculation about the company's future. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, here in Europe, uh, we're focused on French politics, but clearly also focused on the global yield story. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, Dana Albaltaji, who was just on with us, kind of confirmed my suspicions that the yield rise, especially the pace of it, is just kind of freaking people out. The 10-year yield right now at 274.20. This is the highest that we've seen it since, I believe, January of 2019. And it's really the, the speed at which we've gotten to this point that's pretty shocking. S&P futures are down about half a percent right now. So it's not totally wigging out markets, but to some extent, it's just throwing things off kilter. NYMEX crude down 2% to 9626. So Texas Intermediate off about 2% and Bitcoin down about 2.5%. Really, um, if you look at a 20-day correlation, I think you'll see an incredibly positive uh, correlation, Bitcoin to S&P, Bitcoin to NASDAQ 100. So that's why we see it down. Kaylee, what do we see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, there's really one story in particular I want to focus on first, Matt, and that is Twitter. The saga continues. Elon Musk no longer going to be joining Twitter's board. He has actually rejected that offer. That frees him up potentially to increase his stake to more than the 14.9% that was agreed when it was thought that he would join the board. It raises some questions about what exactly his ambitions are when it comes to this company. All of that adding up to a loss for Twitter in pre-market trading of about four and a quarter percent. You also have Tesla, of course, a company which Elon Musk is the CEO and founder of, down by about 3.7%. Really broadly, some of those big technology companies that enjoy higher multiples are being put under pressure by the higher yields you were just speaking about, Matt. That includes NVIDIA, Microsoft. They're down 2.5% and 1.3% respectively. Though for NVIDIA, a bit of a double whammy today because it was also cut to neutral over at Baird, a $225 price target, and that is exactly where it's trading in early hours this morning, Anna. Uh, tech stocks also a focus here in Europe then, Kaylee. Because of that higher yield environment, because of what we're seeing in real yields, we see tech uh, one of the most under pressure sectors here in the European session today. That is weighing on the stock 600, down by half a percent at this stage of today's trading. The CAC 40 in Paris outperforming. And yes, we're focused on the politics, but it isn't all about that. It's also about Societe Generale deciding to sell their assets in Russia and actually finding a buyer that they're able to sell to at this point. And despite the hit, the write down they're going to take on that deal, they are saying they're going to 
stick to their buyback plan and stick to their dividend plan. So all of that well received by investors. And this back to the higher yield story, that's what's dominating, even in France, where we did see a different story in the early hour of trade, the first hour of European trade today, but now falling in with the pack and higher yields across Europe, joining the higher yields across treasury markets. That's the focus for global investors, of course. Uh, let's focus on Russian assets and give you an update there. We saw a 6% pullback in Russian stocks during last week. Today, we see a bit of a move to the ups to the, to, to, into higher territory, up by 6 tenths of 1%. Uh, we've seen that the ruble has been as weak as 177 during the height of the early weeks of the uh, of the war. The, the war still rages, but the ruble has, of course, been uh, shored up by capital controls introduced by Russia. And the Russian 10-year bond yield, to put that in here as well, because we have had comments from the Russian finance minister mm. saying that they would take legal action if they thought that it was sanctions that stopped them from paying their debts internationally. A story yeah. we continue to watch. Uh, the ruble happens. also, I think, Anna, may be shored up by... European countries continuing to pay Putin for gas and oil at an exchange rate of his choosing um, never hurts. Joining us right now is Sharon Bell, Goldman Sachs Managing Director of European Equity Strategy to talk about, you know, what's going on, Sharon, in terms of markets, the, the climb that we've seen in yields and the speed um, that, that we've seen with, with that climb. What does that do to the way you look at um, your investment strategy, the way you look at European equities? Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's been an incredibly fast climb in, in yields across across the whole spectrum. Um, short term interest rates going up, longer term expectations for inflation and interest rates going up. So um, you've had a huge sell up in the bond market. And the speed is a problem for equities. When it happens incredibly fast, equities often find that quite difficult to digest. So we are generally seeing equities react negatively on days where yields are going up. That being all said, um, you, you're not seeing a collapse in equity markets. And I think that reflects the fact that equities are a kind of real asset. Um, in other words, unlike bonds, mm. dividends should grow over time with inflation. And that gives them a little bit of a hedge. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say, Tina, um, but there isn't much of an alternative, right? Other than commodities, where are people putting their money? Uh, no, absolutely. And you are still seeing generally positive flows into equity. Um, and I think the reason for that is exactly this point. There's no alternative. Um, you can put your money in cash, but that will be negative in real terms. You can put your money in bonds, but they're highly volatile at the moment. And with this big sell-off in bond markets, that doesn't look particularly attractive. Um, commodities, absolutely, but that tends to be quite a, a small market and something which is quite difficult for most investors to invest in. So equities gives you yield, gives you potential growth. Some stocks are very mm. correlated with this rise in commodity prices too. And Sharon, if you're thinking about inflation hedges, is, is, is the commodity space still the place to look? And if so, is it about the underlying asset or is it about stocks that maybe haven't reflected some of the moves we've seen in the underlying? Yeah, both. Both. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. I think um, energy stocks or mining companies, um, and Europe has a fair share of those, which is the area that I cover. Um, those companies are a great hedge if you're worried about higher inflation, a great hedge if you're worried about higher commodity prices. And these are not expensive sectors or areas. They've generally been ignored in recent years because they don't score well on ESG um, criteria, but mm. they actually offer incredible cash flow yields. Um, this, this earnings season is likely to be good for these stocks too. Sharon, what messages are you taking from French assets this morning? We see the CAC 40 move higher this morning, but that's not necessarily all to do with uh, the French election. There are other things in the mix there. We've seen the bond market kind of fall into, into, into the same uh, narrative that we're seeing internationally. What messages are you taking away from the first round into the second when it comes to the European equity strategy? So I think that um, the likelihood of Le Pen um, getting in, which of course is, is the concern that the market might have, and, and to the extent that any chance of Le Pen getting in rises, that always um, concerns risk assets in Europe, like equities, like the currency. Um, but I think that the, the, the chances haven't gone up with this first round result. Um, you know, if you look at the sort of odds betting markets, probabilities, they've gone down a tiny little bit. Um, so mm. maybe uh, that's the, some of the reason you're getting a slightly positive reaction. Um, by the CAC. But as you say, it's not just that. It's not going to be the only factor that in influences French assets. Well, Sharon, of course, one of the critical issues in the French election is the cost of living crisis. And that isn't just an issue in France. It's across all of Europe, the UK as well. And as consumers face these higher costs in their daily life, are you worried about the implications that may have for companies' pricing power and the ability to pass costs on? I, absolutely. I mean, this is the focus of the media, but absolutely it's the focus of markets too. 
Um, you've seen more consumer discretionary areas of the market sell off in recent weeks, and I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, that's a true reflection of what's likely to go on. Consumer sentiment has fallen. Um, consumers will see energy costs and food um, price inflation rise quite dramatically. You're already starting to see that, but there's more to come through. Um, in certain countries, you mentioned the UK, you've got interest rates rising, you've got taxes rising, um, and all those things will knock real incomes. So a, a substantial hit, I would say, to demand for consumer discretionary areas. That all being said, it is a little bit balanced because a lot of consumers have savings built up from the pandemic. Um, and there is some reopening demand as well. People want to travel, people want to spend a little bit of money to the extent they have it. But even so, I think that there's a hit to those types of companies, which is another reason to buy the companies that perhaps benefit from these rising prices, like commodity areas. Well, as we talk about consumer and potential demand destruction, I'm wondering, Sharon, where you put the odds of a recession in Europe and if you think the market is adequately priced for that risk? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. We've actually got in our forecast for this second quarter, the one we're in at the moment, a contraction in GDP. Now, I know the kind of technical definition of recession is you have to have two negative mm. sequential quarters. So, but I think there's going to be a good chance we've got a contraction in the second quarter. Um, if these high prices persist into the third quarter, for example, there's more of a hit to real incomes through the summer and into the early autumn. All of those things could mean a recession. So, you know, you've got to think that the chances are reasonably high. If it's a bit less than 50 percent, it's still probably much higher than it would be typically. Um, we do have a contraction in the first uh, in the second quarter rather for GDP. Sharon, thanks very much. Sharon Bell, Goldman Sachs, Managing Director for European Equity Strategy. We will stick with the European focus coming up on the programme. We'll be live from Paris. We'll be talking to the French uh, about the French election with Douglas Weber, INSEAD Professor of Political Science. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Austin Goolsby, former Council of Economic Advisors Chairman. That's at 10.30 a.m. in New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Well, President Emmanuel Macron is set to face his nationalist rival Marine Le Pen in the final round of the French election. It's a rerun of their 2017 contest that will reverberate across Europe. Let's get back to Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua, who is in Paris. She's standing by with Douglas Weber, professor of political science at INSEAD. Francine, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaylee. Thank you. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Professor Weber to talk about the implications and actually the probability of Marine Le Pen becoming president. Given where we are in the polls, given the dynamics of 2022 very different from 2017, what probability do you attach to Marine Le Pen becoming president? I would estimate that uh, right now the probability that uh, Le Pen becomes president is probably about one third. That's to say it's more likely than not that uh, Macron will win. Uh, he has around 4% more votes than Marine Le Pen from yesterday. Yeah. Plus, he has the support of most of the other candidates who were eliminated in the, in the first yeah. round uh, yesterday. However, I mean, we're two weeks away from the, from the second round. And anything uh, can happen A in week two is weeks. a long time in politics. Uh, she, two is double back. Uh, Mrs. Le Pen <laughs> developed a lot of uh, momentum in the last uh, yeah. weeks of the campaign. Uh, the, Douglas, the result is open. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about if Marine Le Pen becomes president of France, what does that mean for Europe? What does that mean for foreign policy? The implications would be uh, massive, uh, really major. In her speech last night, uh, Mrs. Le Pen said uh, the French voters were confronting a fundamental choice of society and civilization. And uh, in this respect, she is uh, not wrong because if she were to win the election, uh, in two weeks' time. This would have a, a massive impact on French foreign policy, uh, its role in Europe, its role in NATO and for European yeah. security. I'll give you some examples. Uh, she proposes to withdraw France from the military command of NATO. Yeah. She proposes to uh, uh, reinstitute the primacy of uh, French law over European law, which means she would basically side or be allies of uh, 
Hungary and Poland in the European Union. Plus, she also intends to downplay and to downgrade the relationship with Germany, which has been the historic core of the European right. Union. And, Professor, you don't think that she'll walk down on some of the things that she said to be more palatable to a European electorate in the next two weeks? Uh, she might try to do that in order to win over votes, but the question is how credible uh, would she be? Of course, after the, the war in uh, Ukraine uh, began, she, uh, she uh, criticized the, uh, the decision by, by President Putin, but she has a long history of a close relationship uh, with Putin. And despite the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, nonetheless, in her election program, which she is not uh, reneged upon, she has proposed that uh, France uh, develop a, an alliance with, uh, with, Fran with uh, Russia to manage uh, the great European security issues. One wonders what she has in mind. But she also is talking about the role of Russia in the Middle East right. uh, and also in North Africa. Mm. Professor, good morning. Uh, she's focused a lot of her campaigning in the first round of this, uh, of this race uh, on the cost of living. Is that going to be the same in the, in the second part? Do you think she'll try and keep things domestically focused? Uh, yes, she, she will, because this is her, her strongest card. Um, she was, I think, very effective and very shrewd over the last few months in focusing on issues of the cost of living and living standards in France, more so perhaps than uh, any other candidate. Um, uh, and particularly after the outbreak of the, of the war in Ukraine and the discussion and the, the impact of, of the war on, uh, and likely future impact of the war on food prices, on petrol prices and so on, uh, this was actually, and given the concerns of many French voters about these issues, uh, this was actually a, a, a very clever, a clever ploy. And, uh, and, and Professor, it's how not you, one to how... which uh, President Macron has very well responded so far. Okay, uh, and so maybe he will try to talk about more the, of that in the, in the next part of the campaign. How divided do you see French, uh, France as uh, right now, Professor? If you could maybe sort of relate that to the more international scene. We've seen, if you add together the, the number of votes for Le Pen and also for Zemmour, uh, quite a sizable chunk going to the far right here. Yeah, France is a, a deeply divided society. Um, it always was in many respects, but it was historically divided along the lines that pr pr primarily of uh, social class. And there was a strong left-wing party or parties, and there was a strong uh, mainstream right party, which uh, differed on issues of distribution and social mm -hmm. class and so on. Nowadays, the main cleavage in French politics is around identity, right. values, and France's place and relations uh, with the outside yeah. world. And, Professor, what are the links between the far right and the far left today? Jean-Luc Mélenchon getting 20% is not insignificant. <clears throat> Who will those votes go to in the second round? Uh, I think they'll probably go, most of them, those that are cast uh, to, uh, to Macron, because last night, uh, and in contrast to his uh, stance in 2017, uh, Mélenchon made it very clear to his supporters they should not vote for Marine Le Pen. He did not say they should vote for, uh, for President Macron, however. So I would expect uh, of his supporters yesterday, quite a large proportion will abstain in two weeks' time. And of those that are left, right. more will vote for Macron than for Le Pen. I was going to ask you how much of a challenge and how much effort will both candidates put into getting people out to vote for them, but just getting out to vote on April 24th? Uh, this will be one of the, the main challenges, of course, and uh, particularly uh, there will be a competition for the, for the support that yesterday went to, uh, to Jean-Luc uh, Jean Mélenchon. Uh, but uh, I, I think the probability that many of his uh, supporters will abstain is actually very high. All right. Uh, Douglas Weber, pro pro professor of political science at Enziad, speaking with our own Francine Lacroix in Paris. Thank you very much for that. Really great insight into the French election and to uh, the French economy and political system. Now let's get to something completely different in the world of crypto. The co-founder of trading platform BitMEX says the route in tech stocks could prompt Bitcoin to fall to $30,000 by June. Arthur Hayes says... Um, Ether could also slump. His warning comes as Bitcoin's correlation with tech continues to rise. The increase further erodes the argument that Bitcoin works well as a diversifier. For now, it's one that's been, uh, that argument been held up by proponents as a key to its appeal. But of course, we're only looking at a 20-day correlation and these things can be massaged, Anna, in any which way. Um, nonetheless, for the 
moment, it looks like very correlated, and that's a problem if you see stocks, especially tech stocks, going down. Yeah, exactly. And if, you, if you're if you long of crypto then. So we see that strong correlation. And yes, these things can be massaged, but it does look a pretty strong correlation between the two, doesn't it? And we've often remarked on how they've moved together, Matt, but perhaps they're both a function of something else, and that is loose central bank policy and, and low interest you know, rates. This... And uh, uh, perhaps they're both responding to the same driver. Yeah, no, 100%. And this is something I'm really excited to talk about with Sam Bankman-Fried. He joins us tomorrow on Bloomberg Crypto. Of course, that's uh, our show every Tuesday at 1 1 p.m. Um, New York time, 6 p.m. in London. We will speak with the 30-year-old uh, billionaire FTX CEO and founder Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, always great to get his insight. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, let's take a look at um, the, the important issues to watch. And first and foremost, and I'm going to say that CPI out tomorrow is going to be um, a huge issue for markets, mm. especially if we see it come in at 8.4%. But that isn't for another 24 hours or 20 seven hours. So in terms of what we're watching today, I'm really focused on Austria's uh, meeting with uh, Putin in Moscow. The Chancellor of Austria, the new Chancellor of Austria, Neymar, is going to meet um, with Putin. He'll be the first uh, Western European leader to go to Russia after the war started. And it'll be interesting to see if he can get any results considering how new he is to the office and um, the fact that they're not a NATO member. Maybe that's why he's uh, got an easier in there, but it's going to be mm. more difficult for him to get traction. Yeah, in, in that sense, yes. Uh, interesting that he's making the visit, that he sees a, a role for himself in doing that, and we will uh, we will watch that with interest. I'm watching what's happening in France, of course. We've been tracking the first round of the French presidential election, and we saw that uh, Macron got more of the votes than Le Pen, but the uh, and the gap was maybe wider than it had appeared. Maybe some market participants who were long-risk assets were nervous about this on Friday, but actually uh, then maybe Macron doing a little better than those Friday nervous expectations has... Uh, uh, allowed the cat care on to, to rally a little this morning. Uh, but it's interesting to look at how assets are responding here. We see, yes, the cat care on moving higher, Matt, but there's the sock gen story in here, which is a little bit se uh, separate. So Societe Generale up by 7%. This on the back of their ability to sell, to offload a Russian mm. asset, which is in itself pretty interesting. They found a billionaire who is not sanctioned sufficiently. He is by Canada, but not by many other places. Uh, so they are, they are right. able to, uh, to do this kind of deal and commit to their buybacks at the same time. Well, I mean... At a loss of what, 3.3 billion euros? Yeah. I, and the stock I mean, rallies, I feel like I could sell anything at a loss hit. of 3.3 billion euros. You know, it doesn't seem but get, like but actually, that much of an achievement. Right, but but getting getting deals done with Russian assets, I suppose, given the global climate and the sanctions environment we're in, maybe that's uh, maybe that's something. Uh, we will continue to watch those stories, as Matt rightly says. We will definitely home in on the inflation story as we go through this week because yields are on the rise this morning. 2.75% is the yield on the U.S. 10-year. We continue to focus on the inflation story globally. That is it for the early edition. Surveillance lies ahead. This is Bloomberg.